Yeah. So I used to do like skits, but with just a cold open. We'll just start like a random chat. Um, yeah. What movies are you into, man? What movies? Yeah. What kind of movies are you into? Anything. Everything. You name what? it, I've probably. Remember, I'm older, so I've probably seen it. Or if I haven't seen it, I didn't want to see it. So did you did you watch Black Phone? It's a pretty recent movie. Uh, is it in the theaters? Uh, no, it's not that recent. It was in theaters. I don't know when it came out. Maybe like last year. Mm, where's it streaming? Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. Black Phone. No, I have not. I have not seen or heard. But what, what's it about? Are you into horror type stuff? Eh, I mean, I've done horror, but a- honestly, after I saw Cabin in the Woods a few years back, yeah, uh, that was basically it for me. It was like, all right, well, we Wait, basically too scary or too dumb. No, no, no. It wasn't that. It was it, it decoded the formula for me. You know, you know, it, it laid it out. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, here is the formula for all horror movies. Oh, and, okay. And it and um, it played out in a in a brilliant way, I thought. Yeah. And it was like, and I told people, I go, look, this is the only horror movie, the last horror movie you have to watch, because after this, <laughs> it, it even mixed in the fact it you it did a parody to where without telling you that the characters they were bringing in might as well been the characters from Scooby Doo. Right. I th- I think that was the the purpose of it. Yeah. When they did that. Yeah, no, I, so, so anyway, so, no, I'll, I'll, hell, I'll watch Black Phone, why the hell not, I mean, I've been... Man, so, Black Phone, to me at least, is a work of genius, the way that this guy made the movie. I don't know if horror is a good category, like, it's not a slasher film, right, so it's not like Cabin in the Woods. Um, it's kind of like a murder mystery, almost, I don't know how, I don't, I don't want, there's, I don't want to explain it. Because it can give away too much, but oh, I have not. I have not even seen a trailer for this thing, so I'm looking so, at the cast. Oh, Ethan Hawke's in it. Yep. So uh-huh. I didn't watch the movie when it came out because of the trailer. I saw the trailer and I thought, ah, it's not for me. It looks kind of yeah. looks kind of dumb. And then, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll put it on on Amazon Prime because I saw it on there. I was like, well, I might as well watch it now that it's here. Holy crap, man! All right. I will. I'm adding it to my list. Heck, I may even watch it tomorrow. Yeah, I think you'll. I think you'll enjoy it if you like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, did you watch? Have you seen Black Mirror? Oh, please. <laughs> the entire yes. I, I want. Not only did I watch all all of Black Mirror, uh, I think I watched all of it twice. Dang. So what did you think and, about that? Oh, Black. Well, I know why he decided to. Um, you know, he decided to pull back. He's not making it anymore. Yeah, because, because they accused him of being prophetic, and and it, and it is. It's it. Black Mirror was always described as looking like ten minutes into the future, and you know, and and yes, the tech, the technology that that emerged with it, you know, trying to show it's like, oh yeah, it, at no point during any of the Black Mirror episodes did you ever think that it that wasn't. Yeah, 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 that it wouldn't be possible ever. I never ever said that, and that's how how close you knew he was. I mean, he was on the cusp. Now, were there morality issues or ethical issues which, which would have stopped some of these things from happening? Sure, but it didn't it didn't mean that it couldn't that it wasn't a possibility, which I loved. Right. I mean, it was, it was a twilight zone. It would, Rod's, Rod, if Rod Sterling was still alive, he would have really enjoyed. I think a lot of the black. <laughs> I think even with the morality things, um, with such a large population, it's bound to happen. Yeah. Right? The, the one, think this the, is... And it was interesting was the one that won the Emmys was the, uh, you know, the most Emmys was the one episode I loved the most, which was the, uh, the downloading of your consciousness into every, into, in, in, well, into the entire tent. No, 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 not that one. That was, that was pretty good though. Yeah, he was really big into like. Oh, by the way, downloading your consciousness—that's just a thing we do here. Um, it was the uh, the one where you could jump between any one of the ten years of the eighties. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that called? I know what you're talking about. I didn't. Uh, I didn't watch that episode. Was it good? Oh my god. Well, it won. I mean, it it was surprisingly good. Uh, it was called San. It was named after the city, the main city that you were downloaded into. Yeah. 
And what what I mean by that was you could jump into you you were after you died, you could I mean you could kind of visit the place when you weren't dead. But after you died, you could be downloaded there and you could jump anywhere from 1980 to like 1989. And you could sw and you could jump in and out of these years. And 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 you didn't realize until you were in it's like, wow, 1981 was very, very different from 1986. And the the I mean they got all the details absolutely right and and for me you know being a kid of the eighties uh, it was it was a nostalgia overload yeah but it was okay. it was but it, but the story was really beautiful and uh, so yeah. if, you, if you why how, wait how could you watch Black Mirror and not have seen that <laughs> um, I think after that was season three wasn't it or season two uh, I think season two yeah um, I think uh, I started I would watch like the preview. On Netflix, you know how if you just put the thing over it, it'll sometimes play like five minutes or whatever. Uh huh. Junu Ju Junipero. Yeah, San, San like Ju. That. Yeah, in fact, there's, I'm looking at some of the uh, San Junipero. Uh, I mean, there's huge amounts of discussions about this yeah. online. Uh, I, I saw that. I saw the season, thing season I, three. Yeah, season three. Yeah. Okay, so by season three, I could kind of tell like some of their ideas weren't as good as season one. Oh sure, and I think that was one of those where I was like, oh, I think I'm gonna just take a rain check on this one because the other ones looked more interesting. Um, no, I have heard a lot of people say that was, one was good though. This one, this one had a had a had a cool happy ending. It was not as dark as the others, and I think that's why it scored better with uh, uh, okay. audiences. But I mean, you know, most of the Black Mirror episodes were. I mean, yeah, yeah some yeah, of them had happy endings, but geez, they were getting weird. Um, the one with Bryce Dallas Howard. Uh, where she was, where she was constantly trying to claw her way up the social, her social media credit score. Yeah, that was a good one. Oh, that was that was heart wrenching. That because, was that was a little too realistic for me. Exactly, it's that's, already happening. Yeah, that's when people started contacting him. It's like, dude, you Holy are. Holy crap! Yeah, you. If you think about it, this is what this is what the social credit score that they're trying to implement is. Is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he. Now, he, oh, truth be told, he expanded on what the Chinese were already kind of messing with. He took it. He took it to the next level, though, with his, which is if the Americans ever embraced it, that's what it yeah. would turn into. And and I mean, it was an extreme situation, but again, not so far extreme that you that you uh, the, the the disillusion. You know, right? You, you were not like, realistic. yeah. At no point did you say, yeah, I'm not buying it. No, suspension of disbelief was absolutely intact. Yeah. That, so. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. So, um, anyways, let's get started. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to What's Wrong with Nick. I'm Nick. You're you. We're us. They're them. And uh, I've got a special guest with me today. Why don't you introduce yourself, man? Hey, my name is Mark Sargent. And... Is that your real last name? Yeah, it actually is my my yeah, father cool. was uh, my father was uh, Ken Sargent, S A. But it's spelled different, so it's S A R G E N T. Yeah, it's uh, not the, it's not the military. There's three types of spellings, but this one's S A R G E N T, like it, phonetically how it sounds. Yeah, uh, but I believe it's English. Uh, and I am if if Flat Earth was a university, uh, I would be the freshman recruiter, the the one you would probably run into first before you decided to jump on ca on campus so okay so there's like other bigger names oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. there's people there's all sorts of channels out there that are bigger than mine the difference is is that i'm usually the guy you run into first yeah you know? um so how i i stumbled across flat across flat earth first i had an uncle who was like super into flat earth yeah and then uh, I was on TikTok and I started getting videos and I was like, you know what? I want to have someone on here to explain this because I'll be honest, from outside looking in, like it sounds ridiculous, right? Sure. Like we've all grown up in school and they've told us this thing and it's like, yeah, that makes, I mean, I guess it makes sense. I don't know a lot of science, so it applies. What they're saying applies seems to apply, so why not? Right. And I thought, let's. I, I want one of these guys on here so they can elaborate and expand. And how do you get from thinking the earth is globe to thinking it's flat? Right. So I reached out to the, this one TikToker who was posting videos. And uh, I believe the video was yours. And he was like, oh, man, uh, I, don't, I don't think I have enough information. And he was like, you should reach out to Matt Sargent. Or, yeah, 
to Mark, Mark, Sar Mark Sargent. Um, he's really good at, at giving ex information and he's really good at talking to like people that are new to it. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And uh, you replied. So I was like kind of shocked. But, <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I mean, it's, I, I try to say yes whenever, whenever possible. And so it doesn't matter if it's a, uh, how large a podcast or a network or a school or whatever it is. It's like, because, because of how my professional career was before I got into this, I was really used to explaining complex topics. It, I boil it down into the easiest possible way you could understand it, which is because I, I used to teach proprietary software. Um, okay. For so like top or um, I, I did a lot of software engineering, but I didn't do a lot of coding. I was the guy that that hung out with the um, I was the bridge between the the programmers and the sales guys. That uh, so when they were when they were pitching stuff to companies, and we were pitching like our time and attendance software systems, which were pretty complex. They would they would come back and ask. They'd say, "Hey, can your software do this for us?" And the salespeople would all you know turn their heads and look at me, and I'd, I'd go, "Yeah." Here's how, what we could do. You know, I would I was really good at coming up with workarounds, okay. and, and because we were dealing with a lot of blue collar factories. Anyway, yeah. do, apply that to to uh, the flat Earth. When I when I made the flat Earth clues, I was like, okay, oh, people so, are gonna have a whole bunch of questions for flat Earth. How can I easily explain it with very little or no math or physics or anything like that? Right, and, most common denominator type thing. Yes, in fact, I I use that that term quite often. Uh, which is, yeah, the lowest common denominator, which is if you just ran into anybody in the street, you didn't know anything about them, could you explain Flat Earth to them uh, over a period of, you know, one to two hours? And yeah. so it turns out, apparently I could. So I came up with the concept of, uh, it's like, all right, here's what I think, how Flat Earth could work, and here's why it's important, and please somebody shut this thing down. Please somebody explain to me how, how I got it wrong. Because really, when you when you push something out to the internet, you've got to be as honest and authentic as possible. You know, especially nowadays, people are savvy enough. They can, they can tell when you're trying too hard and, and they can tell when you're, yeah. when you're all flash. And no well, when you're, what I've come across is people tend to kind of like ignore evidence that's not in their favor. Right, 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 right. No. And, and believe me when I say nobody wanted flat earth to be wrong more than me. Uh, I, I really didn't. I, I just put it out there as like, look, I think it, it, could, it could work. And here's why. Please, by all means. That's why I put out my phone number and my real address and my real name and everything. I, you know, shut me down. Call me up. Let me know. And the people that called me up immediately were, you know, different podcasts and media and stuff like that because they couldn't believe anybody was taking this seriously. Yeah, and, and then I and then I was I kept waiting for that academic call, you know, some professor from some university to say, okay, here's what you did wrong, you know, follow this, follow this logic and this math, and and you can you can shut down your YouTube channel now, and it never happened, and and so it just kept getting Why bigger. And bigger okay, bigger. Wait, before we go into that one, I want I'm what I'm super curious about is how I'm guessing you grew up much like me, where what you were taught was the globe earth. Oh, every, yes, of course. No, yeah. no, nobody, nobody that I knew was taught flat earth. Not only that, but I was, I was unique in that I, at one point when I got into my, oof, my thirties, I actually like, I loved the, I loved old maps, you know, I, so I covered my walls with, with different world maps and antique maps and an extension of that is the globe, of course. And so I had different globes that were, you know, either represented on a, on a flat picture or I collected straight up antique globes from schools that were closing. And, you know, I'd take them off the spindles and I'd make different things with them. And so I had a lot of globes. I had globe bookends, I had all sorts of fun little globes lying around. And so for me to come back from that was really, really saying something. And, and then I then I realized, again, once we got into 2015, that this thing was resonating because other people could understand it too. And they were mostly understanding it because it was easier to get their he head around. It was easier to understand than the solar system model. And that's why I keep putting out to science. It's like, look, this mo the, the flat earth model is way easier to understand. And people will always be drawn to the easier option. Always, always, always. And and yeah. science scientists will come back to this and say, well, that doesn't make it right. And I go, 
No, but if it's easier to understand, we'll have more numbers than you will. And we'll just, and, and so I, in fact, I pleaded to scientists. I said, look, you have to make the solar system model easier to understand, or you're going to lose by attrition. We're just going to keep getting more and more and more people, and you're just going to lose because you're going to sit there. It's like, no, we don't. And because I've had uh, people from the scientific community and the academic community come at me and say, we don't have to make it easier. This is, you know, we shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to bow down and 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 lower ourselves to this level. It's like, okay, it's fine. I'm just why, does the, who, so who, why does the, the numbers matter? The, you mean the number of people that... that yeah. Subscribe oh. to an idea. Oh, oh, the, the numbers met well, one, because especially with social media, they wouldn't have mattered like 30 years ago, but they definitely do now. Because not only because of the, the general public consciousness, but the media and how things are spread, you know, concepts are spread in, in different parts of the world. Is if you have the numbers, your message will get out there bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, look how fast we can spread any message yeah. nowadays. Like, I don't know the air is but, filled with some sort of deadly thing that could kill you at any given point. Right. Look how fast that traveled. And and look at the lasting effects from that. And we did this, it's sort of like a grassroots thing. So, and plus I also believe in the 100th monkey effect, which What's is um, uh, something I've been, been kind of shooting for because I don't really have a, a number for this. 100th monkey effect, uh, you can look this up. Science, science discovered it and then they backpedaled of it from it and called their own research a myth. I was like, what are you talking about? You invented, you know, you came up with this, which is they were um, they were messing around with monkeys and, and, and some islands outside of Japan after World War II. And they were giving them potatoes and watching them and stuff. And, and they noticed that uh, some of the monkeys were starting to wash, you know, because they were dumping them on the beach. And some of the monkeys were washing the potatoes off in the water and eating them, right? It seems like a logical thing. You don't want to eat sand. Potatoes taste a lot better with less sand. And um, they realized that something happened, which was really unusual. When it hit about the hundredth monkey that, that did this, right? All the rest of the monkeys simultaneously knew how to do it. Include not just the monkeys on that beach, but the ones that didn't know about it. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, ones I heard about that. in other islands that were connected to this island. And these like, you just give them the potato, they instantly knew. And I and I recognized it, you know, from, from being in the software background that I was in immediately. Software update. Yeah, it was a software update. It was like some sort of beneficial automatic update that helped that, that helped the monkeys was approved by either an automated system or a manual system. And again, science was backpedaling from this because they don't want to believe in that. They don't. It's like they science is this weird thing, even though it was repeatable. They don't want to. Oh, well, they didn't try this with a whole bunch of different species. They probably did and didn't tell anybody. Um, it, it's something they don't like. And, and that is if they can't. If they can't explain it confidently enough, they back away from it. Sort of like um, cryptozoology, which a friend told me about that term a while ago, which is any species yeah. of animal that they haven't, they don't have in their catalog yet is a myth. And it, which is very, very true over the years. I mean, you know, like the giant panda, such a great example, which is like, okay, you know, can you imagine scientists, right? It's like, okay, so there's like a bear but he's black and white and he's super cuddly and lazy and he only eats bamboo and he just rolls around his back all day. Yeah. And, and, they're, and they're like, yo, whatever. And it's like a walking Not teddy, real. right? Right. And until you catch one. And now it's a big deal. I mean, you know, any panda that's in a zoo, they're like the main attraction. Yeah, but, but until science has one in their lab, it's absolutely a myth and they will mock any anyone but they apply that to everything so, so any any concept that they don't absolutely have quantified in their lab is a myth and they will slam it as you know scientific heresy so is flat earth connected to simulation theory oh in my mind it is sure okay so what i want to I want to I want to get into that too, but I want to know how you went from globe Earth to flat Earth. Like, what was the 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 camel's back that broke? Um, the the when I went from globe Earth to flat Earth, I when I when I, initially when I was looking at it, I was trying to because I I just treated it like one of the the fringe conspiracies, like I said in the documentary, which was it's it's ridiculous. It might as well be Loch Ness. It might as well be Bigfoot. In fact, it's worse. It's worse than that because everybody, which is should be should have been a red flag, which is it's the only conspiracy we debunked to children, <laughs> the only one. And it's like, 
that's kind of weird, you know, compared to everything else. This is the only one we pushed, you know, to grade schoolers and say, oh, yeah, yeah the earth, the earth is a globe here. We're, here's a toy model of it. We're going to put it in your classroom and leave it there until you leave school. And then we're going to stick it in just about every television and movie that you can think of. But it's going to be the background. You're never going to notice it until you become a flat earther and then you notice it every single time. Um, but the. The thing that did it for me was not what usually does it for most people. So most people, it's either long distance photography or gravity versus uh, the vacuum in space or um, you know eclipses or the Van Allen belts and the, the Apollo program or basically everything that NASA has ever done. But for me, it was the Antarctic Treaty, believe it or not, which was. Uh, what is that? For those the, that know the, the Antarctic Treaty, which was put in place simultaneously in the same year that the Van Allen radiation belts were discovered, which it's the only unbroken tra treaty in the history of treaties. And if you know anything about treaties, you know, there's been a lot over the, the, the centuries and they've all been broken. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's almost, a, it's almost a, like a bad joke, which is like, oh yeah, a treaty. Yeah, that'll hold. And this one is, has held forever and it's enforced it very, very strictly, which says that no corporation from any country, it doesn't matter how much money you have, can set up shop in Antarctica, ever. That's what we talking about. It's Don't like we have um, some research things over yeah, there. Yeah, oh yeah, we've got some military and some military research and some scientists down there, but no corporation can go down there and set up shop. And that means, you know, companies with huge amounts of, of, of liquid assets like Exxon Mobil and British Petroleum and, and guys like that. You know, the oil and gas industry, they've known for a very long time that there's been huge amounts of resources down there. And somehow, some way, this treaty was put into place and no one even, not only does it say that no corporation can can set up shop down there again. You know, you if you're an oil and gas company, you, we can start fracking in in your neighbor's backyard. And to, you know, yeah. tomorrow, right? It's easy. And it's been done a lot. They can bend or break the rules as they see fit. You know, people can be bought. But these same companies, not only are they not allowed to go down there, they're not allowed to talk about it. And that was the big thing for me, which was no, I'm talk about going. Well, I mean, yeah, I usually when companies want to do something, they'll make a lot of noise about it. So let's yeah. say you're the, the head of British Petroleum. Right? All you have to do is run a full page ad. And that's why they call them full page ads in the, um, uh, the, the London Times or all the other newspapers say how great it would be for us to start doing work down in Antarctica. Right? Those ads have never, ever run from anywhere. Which means there's something on the level of a national security. Some government personnel has contacted the, the heads of all these companies, you know, the ones that, that could actually do something down there, mostly oil and gas, and some mineral companies like Alcoa would be a great example, yeah. and said, look, um, this is under the blanket of national security. You can't go down there. Here's the treaty just in case you try anything. Um, but if you do try something, we will bury you. We will, you know, pro pro maybe literally bury you, and that's it. And when you retire from this position, whoever takes over, you know, hand them my business card, and or you can tell them yourself, but whatever. And no one's even attempted. No one's even attempted to breach this treaty. Not China, not Russia, not UK. I mean, imagine, you know, the Soviet Union after World War II, they were rebuilding, and so was the yeah. UK, and so was all of Europe. None of these companies uh, went down there. And that, that is kind of weird. I'll admit yeah. that. Um, so, and, and again, this is not a secret treaty. You can you can get a PDF of the treaty online anytime you want. But it's extremely, I've never seen anything where, I mean, as you know, every single inch of ground in this world is owned by someone. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter where you go, outside your backyard, in the middle of Canada, the middle of Alaska, the ground is owned by someone, except for Antarctica. Nobody owns Antarctica. It's like we talk about this place is even by your definition is monstrous. It's yeah. it, it's at least the size. It, mainstream science says it's about the size of Australia, which is huge. And you're saying nobody owns that. So no, that was the big thing for me because look, this 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 world, this our civilization currently runs off greed and money and power. And you're telling me that there's something out there that's so big that is so potentially um, profitable. Uh, yeah, well, destructive. <laughs> Not just, but yeah, well, it's both. It's like, so we're walking away from, the, you're telling huge Wait, amounts. Is it, what, you're saying Antarctica is destructive? Well, think of it this way. 
Yes, there's huge amounts of money, but there are groups out there that are saying they are willing to walk away from it to keep it safe, to keep it hidden. Yeah. And that is because, and I, I believe me when I say, you know, I'm 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 really empathetic when I I put myself in even the bad guy's shoes. Well, in this case, you know, the guys that care about the greater good, which is they look they look at British Petroleum and say, okay, what could happen here? It's like, well, you got these guys coming down there with state of the art helicopters and planes and all this. One of them goes off course. He flies out in this direction for X number of miles, does not come back for a while, or maybe he does come back. And he sees yeah. something he shouldn't sh shouldn't see. What do we do? We're gonna have to tie up a loose end there. Yeah. And then, and how many how many loose ends can you tie up before, as you know, you know, it's the for a good time. Yeah, yeah. We'll start figuring this crap out. And then somebody at the end of the table, it's always, you know, some somebody that's running the show says, "All right, just lock it down. Just seal the whole thing down. Nobody goes there. Nobody's gonna make any money off of this. Just tell them to suck it up." And so uh, that's what we're gonna do. And it's the smart move. You you can't you cannot let the the big corporations go down there. You just can't. So that was it, and uh, that was the the big thing for me. It was a, a monstrous red flag. Again, most people they go off the other stuff. I mean, probably eighty to ninety percent of the people to get into flat Earth it's long distance photography, yeah. and maybe another ten percent go for um, why you know why is our atmosphere still here instead of being sucked off into space. It's a vacuum, but, right? But the 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 you know the the I, I'm kind of weird that way. But I'm glad you know that everyone ran down to the beach because one my clues didn't have anything to do with long distance photography. Um, I just remember people emailing me and calling me. And it's like, dude, I'm I'm sending you some video from you know I was going to shoot a lighthouse from 60 miles away, and I'd be like, and <laughs> why would you do that? It's like because water lays perfectly flat, man. It's absolutely freaking flat out there. And it's like, huh? Did not think about that, and it's just started going from there. Yeah, that should be like the place where it'd be obvious, right? Well, what you mean as far as long distance photography? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. What people were were because of the formula, and I know your your hardcore scientists will argue it. You know, it's funny. They um the the abbreviated version is anything less than five hundred miles away. The curvature formula is eight inches per mile squared, or eight inches per mile per mile. It's not it's not very hard to understand, even if you forgot everything about algebra, you know, it's real easy. You know, it's it's eight inches times itself, um, uh, eight inches times the mileage by itself. So if it's 10 miles, it's 10 times 10, which is 100 times eight inches, which is 800 inches of curvature. Right. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse. And then after 500 miles, it gets fuzzy. You know, the math has, gets a little fuzzier. But eventually what, what we're basically saying is if it's the curvature of the Earth, Eventually, like 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 looking over a hill, forget about the water, you shouldn't be able to see anything on the other side of the hill because it's a hill. You can't see through it. And yeah, around it. The, or, yeah, you can't, yeah, you can't you can't see over the top of the hill. If you're on the other side of a, a small mountain, I can't see you. Well, <laughs> you shouldn't be able to, but HD camera technology has really changed the game over the last <laughs> be good at, at looking around curves. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, what's happened is the resolution has gotten so much better that a boat that you, even if you had, like if you went 25 years ago and you, you tried to use a, um, uh, you know, a, you're the best $3,000 camera on your shoulder, even if you zoomed in on a boat that was 40 miles away, it'd just be this blur. You'd never be able to make anything out. Now there are people with, you know, $400 cameras that they can just zoom in on a boat. It's crystal clear on, an, on a nice day. Yeah. In fact, the, the only limit it appears to um, to be as far as looking at stuff off in the distance is just the thickness of the atmosphere. People forget, you know, because we it, we're funny. We we it's only what our eyes can see is what we believe, and that is, people don't get that we're or they forget that what we're breathing in is only ninety nine percent transparent. You know, you still breathe in a whole bunch of nitrogen and a little bit of oxygen, but it looks yeah. just like the same as if you, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a vacuum chamber, it, yeah. it, looks, it looks identical. But anyway, the, the point is, if you're looking off the distance, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. It's no different than it's a, just a thin version of water, really. It's just a, it's, it's, it's like a transparent fog. And so if you know anyone that, that scuba dives, when you get down to like not even 200 feet on a, on a beautiful sunny day, high noon, there is no sun because the sun cannot penetrate that. And that's the brightest light source there is. 
So imagine that, you know, sideways, you know, you're looking because people will say, well, why can't you see Japan from California? And so it's like, well, because it's the thickness of the atmosphere. I go, however, if you could remove the atmosphere without anybody dying, you probably could see it because that's what happens in the, um, the simulations that we make. You know, the simulations, you know, whether it's Fortnite or GTA or Warcraft or whatever it is, there's no atmosphere. It's, yeah. it's, it's a vacuum, for, for lack of a better term. When you zoom in, it's absolutely crystal clear and it's perfectly flat because we don't make curved worlds in our games. Why? Because people don't. Why? What? Why would you? It makes the programming really, really more a lot more, more difficult. complicated than it needs to be. Way more complicated, and the person's not going to notice anyway. They right. just assume it. And so again, the the art imitating life, and uh, there's just some wonderful layers of illusion here. So, yeah, I've seen the light photography to me at least, or the the photography is interesting because, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's like twenty feet under the curve. Right, so it's not supposed to be visible. Right, 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 right. So if you see a building that's off in the distance, so people will often shoot boats and oil rigs and, and lighthouses and stuff like that. And it, what what makes it, you know, part of it's the engineering of this world itself, which is on some days you can, right? You, some days you can see everything perfectly clear. Other yeah. days you can't, obviously, because of, you know, the weather and humidity and barometric pressure temperature, you name it, they all affect what, what, what we're breathing in right now. There's this wonderful video that was put out um, uh, by Rob Skiba back in the day where he was showing there was an area, you could look it up if you want, it's a time lapse. Every once in a while news stations and meteorologists will shoot things like time lapse. And it's it's a place called Skunk Bay, I believe. And he was shooting it on a, on a crystal clear day in the sun and the humidity and, and all the weather conditions were changing the level of the water, how it appeared to where sometimes the, the, the houses in the distance appeared like they were underwater. And then a couple hours later, you could see the houses. And in the time lapse, you could see these, these, these huge fluxes in, in how you could see things in the distance. And uh, it just add, it adds to the confusion, let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I don't know what to do with that. Like, um, I'm still not completely sold. On the flat Earth, oh, you don't have but to I'm, yeah. I'm intrigued enough to want to know more about it. If that all right, sense. let me let me let me throw this at you because this is usually the the one of the starting points, which is, do you believe the Americans went to the moon in and in, in the 1960s? Ah, uh, mm -hmm. I'm on the fence on that one. I was okay. a hardcore no, and then I went to a hardcore yes, and now I'm <laughs> at. Uh, all right, all right. Well, let me ask. Let me ask you this: Do you remember? I don't. I don't know how old you are, but do you remember hearing about anything called called a space race back in the yeah, day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, it was the Soviet Union and the Americans. You know, now right. Russia, right? There was a space race. We were all, you know, we we're going to go to the, you know, both go to the moon. All of the Russians never officially launched any any plans to go to the moon, and then the Americans got there in 1969, and the Russians just stopped. They, their space program just went into hiding and no one did anything again ever, even though there was, you know, this, all this big hype about going to, um, about going there and no one, no, in fact, the last people supposedly to ever walk on the moon were the Americans in 1972, 1972, and nobody ever even attempted, not even just went. I mean, forget about the, you know, there's five five or six groups with launch capabilities supposedly right now. Yeah. Uh, the Europeans, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Russians, and us, right? Nobody even attempted to go back. Yeah, but it's that like, makes sense to me. What, why, why, why would you do this? You know, why, why would that this... Makes, but that makes sense. It makes sense to me, at least. That, that China wouldn't want to go to the moon? That yeah. Russia wouldn't want to go? That no, no countries want... Why? Because the Americans already did it? Yeah. And there you go. There. What, what are you going like, to... And, that was, not, and that, was the story, that was the story that the Americans tried to push, which was, well, Amer Americans did it, we're the greatest, and it's like, no, that's not how it worked. It was. It, it's a nice initial story, but that's not how it worked. The space race would have been gone like this. We would have gotten there and put two people on the moon, because we've only put, supposedly, two people at any given time on the moon. And then the Russians would have put three. Then we would have put five. They would have put a small base. We would have put a bigger base. And then Time Magazine would have run the story. It says, has the Cold War reached the moon? That's how it would have gone. That's how it's okay. been. So why didn't they try? Oh, they didn't try because they can't do it. 
Because you well, can't. Why, why because didn't they put us on blast? The what? Why didn't they put us on blast on the, during the space race and said? Oh no no no! Because it's mutually um, it's mutually assured destruction at that point. Because remember the the it was the Soviets that had the first space program. We didn't yeah. have space program. Yeah, we founded NASA in 1958, but it was mostly in response to what Russia was already supposedly doing. And it's like, okay, well, the, the follow-up question would be like, why didn't the Russians even try to fake going to the moon? Well, because two studios cannot run the same project at the same time. We've learned this fairly quickly on, which is even if you have like two Hollywood studios that are just like right across town from each other trying to create the same movie, you will have production inconsistencies. And they, we, we could already tell what was going to happen, which was, okay, if you had, imagine in the 1960s, you had an Air Force base in Nevada that was producing our moon missions, and then you had something outside of Moscow, or some warehouse, producing their moon missions. It would have taken two seconds for someone to say, hey, the, you know, the, the Soviet ash program looks really a lot more brown than ours. Ours looks way more gray. It would take two seconds. Same thing, same reason why... For yeah, example, the quality would be different, is what you're saying. It would be way different. So the Americans contacted the Soviets and said, okay, look, we're going to take it from this point forward. Any, We're, we're not going to be there that long anyway. We'll uh, we'll cut it off in the early 70s, and uh, we just won't go back. Even yeah, though we're supposed how, to be... how does that benefit the Soviets? Like, that's again, why I, again, mutually, okay, mutually I, assured destruction. Right. But if we... If listen, we, I, yeah. I think I get what you're saying. But if I'm if I'm the Soviet... Right, I would just say, as far as the only the only height you can get to is the upper atmosphere, which is where you have our satellite. You can't go past it; it's not yeah. possible. And I can prove it that it's not right. It, you're, then, you're, if you're the Soviets, you say this. Yeah, and then you're basically ratting out the Americans. Right. So you win the space race because you well, have the you know? no. Okay. For, first, we got to remember when when this was. This was the late '60s, early '70s. So media isn't what it is now. We at that point we had three television stations and we controlled just about everything from our side. Oh, First okay. off, we would we would just accuse the Russians of lying, just yeah. straight up. Even if you could get that story over here, because our our meet our newspapers would never run that story. Our televisions would never run those those stories. We it would never ever get to to that point. The second part is the Ameri that at that point, if you're the Russians, you can't funnel. Even though it's it's easier to funnel money over there because you don't have as many oversights as we do here, you would still you're you're basically telling their space program they don't exist anymore, and you can't funnel any money into other programs. It was a win-win. It was a, for them. It was like okay, the Americans are going to win the space race, but we're going to keep we're going to we're going to do you know a limited space stuff. They had their own space shuttles, by the way, yeah. which we never we we never saw on camera, but they funneled money into it. You can you can divert money into black site programs. You, don't forget that the NASA's budget today is sixty million dollars a, a day. Oh yeah, hold on. Um, time out real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason why you're saying it's impossible is for everyone else that's listening. It's because there's a dome, right? And so oh yeah, there's there's nothing. To, there's out. nothing to. First off, there's nothing to go to. The moon that you see up in the sky is just a light on a ceiling. It's tiny by comparison. I mean, the mainstream science says it's 2,000 miles wide. We say it's probably 50 miles wide, and it's probably only two-dimensional. No different than a planetarium. You go to a planetarium, for example, I know that kind of dates me. Planetarium, for those of you who don't know, is a place where you, you go in and you lay on your back if you're a school kid, and they show you the stars on the ceiling. Right? Yeah. And on, on weekends, they, they turn it into a laser show. You can go get there and get baked. I don't know if they let you get baked anymore. But you, you know, they do like laser, yeah. laser Floyd and Led Zeppelin and crap like that. So, um, oh, is that what the Laser Floyd concerts were? I thought it was like a regular concert with lasers. Oh no, Laser Floyd is usually in a planetarium. Well, sometimes. Oh, okay, cool. okay, there's, there's. Duh, don't get me wrong. Pink Floyd. There's, there's. Yeah, there's Laser Floyd you can do outside. I don't want to get into that. All right. Anyway, <laughs> All right. So, so anyway, the point is, if you're laying in a planetarium and looking up on the ceiling, you you see a moon. Does it look spherical? Sure. Why can't Why can't you land on it? Well, because it's just a light on a ceiling. It's it's silly. Yeah, it's you know, it's the question is when you walk outside of that planetarium, who's to say that you're not in a much much bigger one that we had nothing to do with? We didn't build this place. Yeah. It was built by someone that was here way before us. 
uh, and uh, they 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 run the show, not yeah. not us. So we had nothing to do with it. Yeah, that's why so I was no. that's why I was clarifying because you were making if for. I mean, if someone doesn't know why, right? Like, why stop? Why give up? All that. It's like right. it still doesn't make sense. But the reason why they gave up, I'm clarifying for everyone else, is because there's a dome. So once you once you're capable enough to get up there, and then you hit it, and you realize that. Like I can't go anywhere. This is it. Yeah, yeah, you're not going anywhere. No rockets. Yeah. Rockets can only go so high, and which again, which is why NASA. You know what I talked about in the clues. You know, the everything leading up to our space program in 1958 was exactly what I would have done. Which is okay. Let's say you figure out in the early 50s that there is some sort of barrier that you're living basically in a snow globe. Well, the first thing we want to do, especially if you're guys, you're going to want to blow a hole in this thing. You know, get the cannons. And cannons aren't working and the missiles aren't working and so you start up with megatons and the first three shots you know every, again not secret information from 58 until 62 the united states and soviet union all their atomic weapon testing was straight up it was all aerial there was there was no underground stuff there was no water shots it was all aerial for four years why? the what did they say why nope why? <laughs> nope what oh, i didn't know that I mean, atomic weapons testing is like, you know, they, they could they could say anything they wanted. And uh, hey, wait, wait, hold on. That's not fair. So you're saying I'm not allowed to aim my gun up in the air and fire it because I could kill someone. But they're allowed to aim a nuclear missile right. in yeah. the air and shoot it. And that's oh, okay. so wait, that that part, as much as I hate myth busters, that part is a myth, by the way. You can fire it. And it's only because the, the bullet slows down so much yeah. when it's falling. Well, yeah, because the terminal velocity of the bullet with its weight by itself isn't enough. Like no, 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 no. It's it's very, very slow. Now, will it hurt a lot? Yeah. Will it pop? You know, will it possibly crack your skull? Sure. But is it coming down at anywhere near bullet velocity? No. No. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, I love the fact that they went out in the desert and they. I think they set up a Glock, if I'm not mistaken, and fired like a nine millimeter straight up. And they, you know, they fired multiple times, and then they would listen. They had these sound sensors to listen when it, when it hit the, the 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 mud, you know, so they could pull the, the pull the bullet out. And I thought that was fascinating. Anyway, but yeah, for four four years they fired these weapons, um, but after the first three shots, when they real, you know, which were megatons, after those, the, the for the Americans, the rest were were kiloton weapons, which were you know bigger than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But they were um, they were they weren't even close to our top of the line, and that's be and I knew why they were doing it. It's like, oh yeah, you're gonna paint the sky at that point. It's like, well, let's not waste, you know, waste the if megaton can't get through whatever you're trying to get through, well, you're stuck. So at that point, you're just using weapons with big blasts. You're kind of paintballing the ceiling to figure out what the shape of the ceiling is. And they did that for four years, and both the United States and Soviet Union stopped at exactly the same time in 1962. Why? Oh, well, just a mutual well, thing. If, I mean, if, if glow birth is true, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, one, why? Why were they trying to disprove glow birth? They weren't. They weren't trying to disprove glow birth. They well, what they were trying they, to do. Everyone sees the dome, right? If you paint it. Yeah, the general general public wouldn't know what they were looking at. And when they're doing these these tests, the, they're not getting anywhere close. The closest they ever got to any populated area was Hawaii. And uh, they they that one didn't turn out as well because there was an electromagnetic sorry, electromagnetic pulse that uh, knocked out some of the electronics in in Hawaii, but it doesn't really matter. No one no one would have figured it out anyway. No one knew what they were looking at. The the government knew what they were looking at and only the high levels, but that was only because they they kind of had an idea. Imagine this, for example, they, they weren't trying to disprove the globe. They didn't know. I, I, I should probably back up a minute, which is they didn't even know until uh, the Antarctic missions for sure that they were uh, that they were in some sort of dome, meaning we didn't, our best and brightest didn't know almost until 1960 what this place was. They had rumors. They had maps. They had the old texts. But they didn't know for sure because we didn't have the the uh, the, the cool toys that could figure this thing out. And then right. when we finally figured it out, we'll just call it round up to 1960, when we finally said, ah, crap, we are in a snow globe. The decision then comes like, okay, do you tell the general population? No, yeah. you can't. 
You can't. It's it's too late. And and by that I mean, and I agree with them on on this, which is the, the civilization, the cement of civilization had already been hardened. The infrastructure was already set up. Everything was running just fine. Are you really going to go in there and tell people, tell the people of the world they live in a snow globe? They would freak out. I mean, there you know, a lot of people nowadays. I mean, now, 2023. Now, a lot of people would be like, all right, all right, well, you know, they'd probably deal with it, but there'd be a fringe amount of people, first off, that would just head straight into the freaking snow of Antarctica and just won't want to see it for themselves or they'd want questions answered. But the biggest the biggest problem there is you're you're backpedaling on something that you told people was absolute science for centuries. And you're telling them that they were either, well, one, they were wrong because eventually you'd have to say, yeah, we didn't even know until like 50 years ago. And people would be like, okay, so what else are you wrong about? And then the yeah, other isn't questions. That, isn't that kind of like accepted now that science is sometimes wrong? Well, actually, it's constantly wrong. Well, it depends who you talk to. I mean, come on. Again, don't forget what's happened over the last three years. What what uh, what happened there? There's lots of people that say that science was wrong over, over the last three years, and yet, you know, it's, find find me a, a class action lawsuit, find me Senate hearings, find uh, me oversight meetings, find yeah. me anything along those lines. But I think so, now they're admitting they were wrong. Actually, well, I mean, well, that, yeah, they're they're I know they're kind of getting there. Yeah, kind of there. but but with this, it's too big. It's too freaking big, and they they didn't know what to do with it. I mean, I can't remember. Don't forget that 1947, when a base commander who was way too enthusiastic, and you know the war was only a few years before that, decided to tell everybody and go to the newspapers and say, "Hey, you know what? <laughs> we found a flying saucer. We're heroes." Hey, right? and the the general public. This was just this was pre television. Yeah. And the newspapers were freaking out, and that was over a single spaceship that crashed in the in the in the farmlands of Mexico. Yeah. So yeah, no, the people weren't ready for it in 1960. I, they might be able to take it now, and the way it's been spread in social media through a lot of back channels and grassroots things, I, I think that people are are way more uh, accepting of the possibility. Plus, we've come on, we've got alternative science fiction stories that cover every gamut and this this is not a new concept i mean come on there's been like two or three twilight zone episodes which actually talked about this stephen king's you know the under the dome tv series and and stuff like that I mean, this, this is this is not a complete foreign concept to people but yeah. because of our conditioning because we are shown the globe since we were you know six years old it's still hard for a lot of people to to deal with because oh. you know, the knee jerk reaction is, well, what are you talking about? We know it's a globe. This is something I had I had never heard that even our scientists didn't know the Earth was flat in the '60s. I always thought, like the way I thought the whole theory went was, we've known it's flat since ancient history, and then modern scientists came and said, actually, it's globed. Right. Well, if every if if you type in ancient cosmology into Google and click on images, you will see every culture that ever was, including the Greeks at one point, they all drew the same thing. They all drew a snow globe, and then sometime around 500 years ago, the uh, the solar system model was introduced. And, yeah, the, and the snow globe. They weren't drawing it necessarily because they thought that's what the shape was. No, no, that's what they thought it was. Before, before, remember, we're going back, let's say even, even a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago is a long time, yeah. right? Every culture, because remember, this predates language in a lot right. of cases. So, well, a lot of the, the drawings that you're talking about, at least the ones that I've seen, are, are post language and post language. Okay, post language. But, well, okay, all right, all right. Let me, let me clarify this. Post language, but most of the population couldn't read and write. Okay, yeah, fair. So when you, even 500 years ago, everyone drew the same thing because there was nothing else to look at. You know, you're, you're watching the scars, you know, slowly move through the sky and they're going in sort of this arc thing. And so, you you know, you do your deductions and it's like, oh yeah, we probably live in some sort of snuggle. Again, everybody drew the same thing. But when the solar system model was put into place, the revolutionary idea came out, which was, no, 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 the stars aren't moving. You're moving. 
and it's like oh okay and then uh, but, like sorry. okay going along with that same trajectory they yeah. also thought the stars were the bodies of gods or angels sure it's well some people did i mean they're depending on what culture you're talking about they yeah, well, everybody, everybody, everybody thought a lot of stuff judaism that's sure. what i think um the mayans did as well and so did uh egyptians sure so, I think that's that's fair to say across at least different cultures they had the same conclusion. These are the these are gods. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, think of think of the 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 relatively benign stuff, which is you know the when you're you're creating the zodiac, and you're yeah. creating your anima animomorphizing you're creating the the hum the yeah. the our civilization figures in the stars, and then you're generating stories about them, and then you're tying your own future to those stories and and figures and and i mean even today come on you could type in you know astrologers near you and you can get a reading from somebody that's probably not even 10 miles from your house depending on where you live even now so but then again when the solar system model came into play it was worked out really well because slowly but surely again most people couldn't read and write you didn't even have to they didn't have to read or write you just showed them the model the models would, you know, started to spread everywhere, and all the institutions had them. And oh, that's all you need. Okay. It doesn't matter if you get a D in school or if you're a straight A student. The globe's still in your classroom, and everybody knows what it is. Even right. the dumbest kid in school knows what that globe is. So, and this is, I might maybe it, this is like um, miss learning, or like maybe they were teaching you propaganda. But wasn't the whole reason why Columbus was so sure? That he could get to to India, going the opposite direction was because he said, "I mean, by that point, common knowledge was the Earth is round. Uh, by that point, there that was what they were already yes. well by well, not so even he, not even so much not even so much common knowledge. It was the pushed knowledge. Even okay, yeah, fair even enough. The, even the but, church started to bend because they realized that science the the way all, science is going." Knowledge. Or the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church sentiment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but that's what he was trying to help. I mean, I think the way that it kind of happened was, hey, look, if the Earth is round, which we've been saying it is. But by, by the way, if we don't. We don't. Our, our community doesn't use the word round. We use ball or sphere or globe. Don't okay. forget, your dinner. Your dinner plate is round. A hubcap that's, is round. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if the Earth is is a ball, uh, globe, a, a ball. Yeah. Then that means I can just go in this direction and get to India. And they were like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. But try it. And he didn't. Right, because he hit another landmass that they didn't know was there. Right. And well, heck, let's take it one step further. Um, the the famous female pilot Amelia Earhart, who who was trying to fly around the world, but because of the distance, the distance changes between the, the flat model and the globe model, she was using the globe model. At some point, at least I believe, uh, it, it wasn't a big surprise to me once I looked at her route, was she was never gonna make it because her fuel was gonna run out. But she didn't know that. You know, all of a sudden she's looking at her gauge going, yeah, the island should be anywhere around here. And she never made it, she had to ditch somewhere. Uh, wait, 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 hold on, elaborate on that one. Cause I, so I know that she died making the trip. But right. why would why would the trip be possible in the globe they had, but not in the flat Earth? Oh, because the the flat model, the flat model, the distances where she was going would have been slightly longer than the globe model. If she was if she was going, uh, in, you know, outside of the equator, the outer ring, the distances would have been longer. She wouldn't have, again. She would not have known this, and so if she was cutting it close, even in the slightest, and she was a hell of a pilot, from what I understood. She would have come up. She, she would have come up short, even if it was only a hundred miles short. She still would have come up short and couldn't. There, you know, radio technology was not exactly widespread back then, so she couldn't tell anybody. Huh. But again, that's just another little little side thing. But like people will also say, you know, oh Galileo, you know, cir circumnavigated the world. It's like. Yeah, but that, that also works on a flat model. And again, if you take a, a dinner okay. plate, you. you I always thought the math that they were using. Only works if it's globed. What for Galileo? Yeah, 
Uh, we're, we're, to, we're talking a sail ship. The, the math, the math is fuzzy at best. You know, the course corrections back then were very, very, very common. So, if you again, if you take your finger on a dinner plate and you run it around the outside of the, you know, the dinner plate, you know, make a circle, and you come back to your finger. You know, well, technically, you've circumnavigated that dinner plate. That doesn't make the dinner plate a globe. It just means you circumnavigated it. And to to you because you might bring it up eventually, which is the compass. It's like okay, well, you know, one, wouldn't the compass be wrong? It's like no, the magnetic north is just in the center of the dinner plate. Things are always wrong. I've bought like six different knives that come with the compass. It's always wrong. Uh, I I, tell, I I make it even worse for you. But you. Don't forget that again. We don't we don't teach a lot of this in school anymore. Which is magnets are you know bi bi bipolar, right? There's a north magnetic north and magnetic south <laughs> like most people like, like most women <laughs> there you go bipolar yes and but but when you get below the equator right so when we're here where we are you know the compass always points north it always dominates north well when you get south of the equator on a globe it should eventually dominate south right there should be this big strong magnetic south you never ever hear about it and to where I've talked to people in Australia and New Zealand and military people said, yeah, there is no magnetic south. In fact, you can look it up online. There's all sorts of people who had nothing to do with us. They're Antarctica. Kids ask pe people in Antarctica this all the time. They say, what, what does the compass do? You know, it's like it doesn't do anything in Antarctica because where the heck is magnetic south if it's the outside edge of a snow globe? Yeah, but and it doesn't work in the North Pole either. The what? It doesn't work in the North Pole either. No, I've never been to the North Pole, so I couldn't tell you. But, oh, yeah, but, I mean, but plus, there's not, there's, there's no supposedly there's no land mass at the North Pole. So oh, yeah, on the ice, I guess, whatever. It, it doesn't work there. Well, all right. Let me re, let me rephrase this. Like if they're if you, if you get if you get dead on to magnetic the magnetic North Pole, yeah, it may not do anything. Oh. But up until that point, the compass works. Well. Okay, so their best explanation is it's so cold the magnet doesn't function properly. Yeah, that explanation could be applied to both, and we see the same result in both. I, I by the way, I've never ever heard that in my life ever, and I've been doing this for eight years. Never well, heard anyone say that the compasses don't work in cold weather. In fact, it's the opposite. There is a scientific thing that says when you heat up a magnet to a certain point, it loses all its magnetic properties. Which goes in, by the way, to a whole nother thing, which we probably shouldn't spend too much time on, which is uh, the core of the Earth, which is, okay, if the core of the Earth is molten, but you say there's this big magnetic field that's generating, how is it doing that? You've already said before a magnet even gets remotely molten, it completely becomes demagnetized, which makes sense. But I've never heard the cold one, ever. Huh. Anyway. I'm, I'm looking it up just to double check that oh, I didn't right. miss here. Um... I do see the. If you could freeze, uh, if 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 compasses did not work in cold weather, by the way, I mean really cold weather, there'd be a lot of dead explorers. Okay, so a Germany-made compass can work up to negative forty degrees Celsius. Down to that's, that. That's that's fine. So I don't know how cold the poles are. The the poles can be pretty cold. Uh, the point, the no, point, no, the point is, is that South never dominates the magnet, ever. Meaning, meaning when, when, again, when you're walking around, I don't care what your compasses are doing right this second, but when people are walking around outside, compasses always point north. Yeah. Never do they waver, and all of a sudden, as you get more and more south, and then all of a sudden start dominating south for whatever reason, they should dominate south. The reason why most people don't notice is the majority of the population of our world lives in the north part and there's not a lot of people and again antarctica is locked down so yeah anyway. i always thought they 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 pointed north because the magnet was mostly the same magnetic field that the north part was and that was really the only reason that i had for that huh i think any sorry move, moving on yeah. What else you got? Um, okay, so oh man, I, I don't know. I'm kinda I'm kinda stumped. Um no, 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 throw me throw me some stuff. What so uh, what, 
what do you like about the what do you you know you, the Apollo program the the move the NASA program you you might let's be on board say, with let, let's say that's uh, I've seen people debunk that that they're basically most people would say like no this definitely happened and here's why right um it is kind of weird so I looked into the reason why haven't we gone back and then they keep saying technology is lost what they mean by that is we don't have the infrastructure to make the stuff that we need to go to the moon versus before we had a bunch of factories in states like in the country that could make the stuff that we needed and they were already there and set we don't have that like we can't go back um, fair enough. Okay. No. And they no. Tell- no, no. No, 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 no. That's not, there's no fair enough here. What do you mean? You, you we don't can- have factories here. We closed those and we moved them to China. Okay. Let me, let me drop some knowledge on you here. Ooh. NASA is a collection of parts. NASA is a collection of parts from companies like General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, any military contractor. That's who builds the parts for, for NASA. NASA does not have its own factories. They, they, they get all their money and they buy the pieces of everything. They collect them. They, yeah. collect them, they launch them. The reason why you, you, the reason why you can't come go back, the reason why you don't want to go back and you tr- drag your feet at every given chance you can is because the technology, the observation technology by the general public has gotten so much better every decade that it would be terrifying to try to fake a moon mission. And I've said this since day one, which is, if somebody, if the government came in to me and said, hey, we're going to, they back up a dump truck full of $100 bills, I mean, billions of dollars in, in my yard, and they said, we're going to pay you unlimited money to fake a moon mission, I'd go, get the hell off my lawn, because I couldn't do it, because it all comes down to the, to, again, to the lowest common denominator, the weakest chain in the link. Yeah. It's, it, they were terrified to do it even back in the 60s. Think about it this way. For example, you, you know, there isn't a single photo from any of the Apollo missions that has, and again, this is one of the weakest arguments, but I'm gonna throw it at you anyway, which doesn't have stars in the background, not one. Yeah. And thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures taken, not a single star shot was taken. And, and people say, oh, it's an exposure setting, an exposure setting, I'm going, okay, the fact that you know it's an exposure setting means that you can change the exposure and at least take one roll of the stars. But then right. the astronaut said, oh no, no, we couldn't see stars either. It's like, well, okay, but, be, because you kind of, again, if I had to make this sort of production, here's the problem. You look it up, you know, wherever you're shooting this thing in a warehouse, you have to fake the stars. The belt of Orion has to, because at, the thing about the pictures was everything is time and date stamped. Had to be, because you know all the nerds wanted to know where you were during this time. So they had a script to follow. If the belt of Orion in the sky isn't exactly where it should be at that date and time, You've got a problem, and that's just one picture. If it's screwed up right. in more than one picture, and so, so people are going, look, it's going to take forever to adjust the stars in this soundstage. We can't do it, and so somebody makes the decision. It's like, no stars. No, no, no stars ever. And you're saying, oh, okay, was well, again, that was an exposure setting. Artemis, if you've heard that name recently, the Artemis program, which is supposedly the new moon missions, moon missions to Apollo 2.0, which yeah. just was, you know, just did its thing back in, in 2022, Went around the moon and back unmanned with all sorts of HD cameras on it. Not a single star was seen ever in any shots. But we're not talking about exposure settings anymore. Now we're talking digital, right? You yeah, can but t- digital cameras also use exposure. I mean, it's it's not it's 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 these are top of the line NASA things. You're telling me that not a single camera on that probe, which should have been bristling with cameras, not one of them will even accidentally with all the filter settings that that they have nowadays i mean we're talking top of the line stuff this is not 1969 anymore right no one's going to take a there there are no stars so and and moving forward i'm going to throw this at you i don't want to be rude when i say this you're telling me that moving forward we're never going to see stars in a space shot ever okay before one no i I mean i i can see why the cameras would be set to a specific parameter and then kind of i mean there's no reason for the stars but um, with the kind of te- telescopes that we have and all this stuff to track things, why can't we just say, look, we tracked this spaceship and it never left the atmosphere? You lost me. So Houston launches a spaceship. Oh, oh right, 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 right. It's going to the ISS or the moon, whatever. It doesn't matter where it's going. Right, right. There's enough 
um, autistic people out there to say, hey, look, I, I was following this and it never left the atmosphere. So I don't know why they're saying that it's up with the ISS or on the moon when I saw it land. Why don't we see that? I mean, why hasn't anyone figured out exactly? Oh, because once it gets out of, because the visual range is limited. You can only see something go so far and then it goes into telemetry, which is why, by the way, all the ground, well, I'll take it one step further, which is the, the cameras that NASA has on the ground, it would be in their best interest to film this thing for as long as humanly possible. But once it get up, gets up to a certain altitude, not even 50 miles, they cut to a, you know, a CGI transmission. It's like, oh, okay, this is an artist's illustration of what the probe's doing right now. And it's like, we, we never ever see this. And as far as the autistic people, the, the, no one's ever caught it. No one's ever reported it. And I mean, I've... I think that, that should be the challenge for, because um, I mean, the, the flat earth community is not that small. I think that as far as trying to film, people try, right. people try, people have tried to film stuff all the time. Never, never can do it. No, but this, but, this, this is a little bit different because the missions are planned, right? They kind of tell you how they're going to get out there, what oh, they're yeah, going to yeah. do trajectory so you just have like three or four people in line right hundreds of miles apart but ready for this launch cameras cameras can't see that far or or the object is too they small see, they can see past the curve it, it, that's that's it's not that far they can't the cameras the, the the cameras and plus as far as so shooting stuff on the horizon it has got to be you know if it's not backlit by the sun probably limited 40 or 50 miles, give or take, right? If, if it's not completely backlit by the sun. If the sun is behind it, yeah, you can go up to about 100 miles, maybe 100, is it 130, 140 miles, if the sun is directly behind like a mountain off in the distance, you know, when it's setting behind a mountain. But as far as looking up in the sky and trying to find spacecraft, all right, come on, even our best stuff, people track the ISS all the time. And by the way, do I think there's stuff up there? Sure, you bet I do. Uh, do I think there's people living on it? No, no, not not a chance in hell. I mean, look at look at up the the little stuff. Like, why is NASA the largest producer and consumer of helium in the world? They basically own the helium market. And again, it's not a secret. Where it's like they can launch, and they've been launching since the 1950s, satellites on balloons. We kind of na named satellites, you know, up to what four tons? That's eight thousand pounds. Yeah. Which begs the question, it's like, if you can launch them, because there's some spectacular accidents, because they, they, they launch these things from everywhere, with special weather balloons that, for whatever reason, they figured out how they can keep them from detonating when they get up to a certain height. But Why would they, wait, 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 why would they detonate? Oh, because weather balloons, if they're not controlled, no different than any balloon. Once it gets up to a thin enough act, um, atmosphere, it just expands and expands and expands until it finally just blows up. You know, not, detonate's probably not the right world, pops. Yeah, it pops. It okay. just pops. But if you if you can stabilize the the balloon at a certain altitude, you can keep it up, keep it up there for a very very long time because it's so far above the weather. But if but it begs the question: if you can lift a a vehicle again, there's wonderful videos out there I can send to you um, of something like four tons, you know, a couple cars, you know, into the air, you know, at satellite height. Then what are you putting on the rockets? And why would you put them on the rockets when you can do it for pennies on the dollar? And that's, again, one of those questions they don't like talking about. Which Wait, is, hold on. So these balloons get up to the same altitude as the satellites? Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought they, like, I thought they were lower, like a lot lower. Oh, the, well, that's just it. It's part of the myth, which is you can get the, the average civilian, uh, civilian mind, mind you, or I don't know, the Red Bull jump, which was did a few years ago, can get up to about 130,000 feet, which is eh, three, four times uh, commercial well, airline height. But like, at that Sorry, go ahead. Uh, let's say, let's say, let's accept that as true, right? Then yeah. why launch missiles at all? You mean rockets? Yeah, the rockets. Oh, to make money. <laughs> I mean, if you can, if you can money? sell, if you can sell somebody, and for example, if you say, oh yeah, we're going to put your rocket on one of our, you know, our sat a satellite on top of one of our rockets, because the people that make the satellites are almost uh, never the people that launch the satellite. Huh. Then you hey. charge them whatever you want, and but and 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 then I because I've talked to people that you know that work for these rocket companies, and it's fascinating because they get all these specs from the satellite people in advance. 
which is perfect because all you need, you know, you get you get this, their satellite specs, and then you send this thing up there with a balloon, and you can, yeah, their transmission works yeah. just like it's supposed to, um, and then you charge them whatever you want for the rocket, and the rocket's empty. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I, I, that makes sense to me, right? The, the companies have an incentive, like NASA, to make money. Right. And this is a profitable way. Because obviously, you're telling the company that wants to set a light launch, it's just, like, you have to cover the expense of launching it. Oh, yeah. You can, charge, you can charge whatever you want, and they'll gladly pay it because, you know, rockets are expensive. In fact, so, they have well, nothing, nothing to compare it with. So, money's so not. How, how does, how does uh, like, someone like. Um, Elon Musk and Bezos get up there. Uh, okay, well, first off, Virgin Galactic and Bezos, you can just throw those guys out. Um, back in the day, and this was going back seven years or so, there was the um, Google X Prize, which it was they were going to pay $20 million to any company that could send a probe to the moon and then shoot pictures back. And there was like five or six companies jockeying around for a position. And in the end, nobody launched nothing. Right? As what far as that? so, but as far as Elon's concerned, oh my God, he is one of the worst. I just wish he would go away in, in a horrible rocket or well, helicopter. I've seen the video where the green screen, the green screen of the car, glitches. Sure, that's interesting. Oh, 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 you, oh you want to talk about the the Tesla Roadster in space? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I can tear that thing about in part in two minutes. Uh, first off, the, everything about that car was wrong. Supposedly it was taken from his garage and put in a capsule and sent into space with no modifications whatsoever. It's like, okay, well, what about every pressurized system in that would have exploded because anything in a vacuum that's pressurized is going to just explode, including the tires. Um, and granted, there was no gasoline system. It was electric, but I don't know, the, the hydraulic system, the even the window washer fluid would have would have destroyed that car. But the tires would have, would have turned into bombs and blown the fiberglass all over the place. The temperature swings from positive to negative would have spider webbed all the windshields. Yeah, that's it true. Would have been, it would have been a disaster. Oh, that's but that's not the part that bugged me about that car. You know what bugged me about that car? There was no endorsements on it whatsoever. I mean, we're talking about a public company and a private company, right? SpaceX and Tesla. And that thing should have looked like NASCAR. It should have been wall-to-wall -wall advertising. And there wasn't. In fact, why, why? was it? But it's because they weren't sure they could fake it. They weren't sure how. Know, the, why, why would it be advertised? Why would it be? Boy, were you kidding? <laughs> think about this. If it was a Ford truck, you think they'd pull the Ford logos off of it? No, but I would say Ford and Tesla are very different companies. No, they are not. They are car companies. They are trying to sell as many cars as possible. And advertising, oh. the advertising companies are departments are monstrous. In fact, when not only that, why wasn't there a picture, a banner of this car in any, any, not every, any Tesla dealership ever? In fact, why didn't you? <laughs> well, why okay, didn't that you one. Well, but maybe because you're then you're painting the idea of like, hey, you can drive this car in space, and that's not. I mean, that's false advertising. You can't drive it. Really, really, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna pull. I'm just saying this is because. Vital. because because Indeed. advertising companies don't do any false advertising ever for anything ever. Maybe, especially maybe Elon. Maybe Elon does it. Well, Elon. Elon has admitted himself that the reason why Tesla is big is because of, of government sponsorship. Yes. Right? Yes. So, yes, yes, yes. so he's not hiding the fact I, that advertisers aren't playing a role into Tesla. It's the government. Come on, man. The, he's all about. If he wasn't about media presence he wouldn't be in the media all the time uh, it's all he cares yeah he likes the media yeah, in fact, not why, not, why not use the um why use that stupid red sports car the convertible i mean that's all that's yesterday's news everybody drives the freaking sedan the four-door s model that's all anyone cares about is it's that's yeah. a, that's the flagship car in fact that's a four-seater so why make a generic mannequin that doesn't look like anything sit in the driver's seat you could have sold I mean, come on, you could have sold the subcontracted out to Disney, to those four seats, you could put a stormtrooper, a stormtrooper, Iron Man, Groot, and um, Boba Fett. Okay, I, okay. Uh, what you're saying basically is he could have made money instead of just spending money to do this. He could have made more money. Oh, yeah. he, could have turned it, he could have turned it into a media circus, and it went completely yeah. opposite. There were no I've Tesla heard. logos. There was no SpaceX logos. There was nothing. Even the mannequin didn't have anything on them. 
And so you're saying the reason why it was all empty and blank is because they weren't sure they could fake it. Not not completely. And they were and there so was a huge thing. Elon, they Elon and them knew that there's a dome. Elon doesn't have to know that, being that, again, if you're a government puppet, there are certain levels of clearance, kind of like people say, well, does Neil deGrasse Tyson know or, or did, um, you know, Bill Nye know or any of the other physicists? Like, no, they don't have to. You know, compartmentalization is the, the better option. Don't tell Elon, to, to be honest, he why keeping him out of the loop is better. He just keep him just making the ridiculous headlines like he always does. And again, by the way, I, I love the fact that the general public just immediately, without even batting an eye, when they said, oh, yeah, by the way, he was, he's not anymore, supposedly. He, he, he's now the richest man in the world. It's like, wait, what, how, how did that happen? It's like, because you got to remember, you have to do something to, to, to get something. So when, um, when Bill Gates supposedly was the richest public man in the world, there are private people that don't care about money at all. Right. You know, families, they, don't, they don't want people to know that they're rich exactly perfect true power stays hidden that rule has never ever changed publicly yeah. bill gates became became the most powerful most expensive man because everybody and i mean everybody owned microsoft products right and yeah. then when jeff bezos came along it's like yeah i don't know anyone that doesn't have an amazon membership right yeah. it, it, some sort of everybody owns that damn thing because they have to because it was a clever clever thing but when all of a sudden visa or when musk came out it's like it's like oh yeah hey, by the way he's the richest man in the world it's like what are you talking about? I can I can drive for miles and miles and not see a single Tesla. Yeah, there's more now than there used to be, but it doesn't even compare to the amount of Priuses that I saw out there or Subarus yeah. or all this other crap. And and then you realize it's like, oh, well, because he's green and the government's completely running his show, they just sank billions and billions of dollars into his stock and made him the richest guy in the world. It has nothing to do with what he sold. It's just yeah. the government backing him. So oh, yeah, now, for sure. So as far as SpaceX is concerned, no, it's completely bought and sold from minute one. And don't forget that when you want to hire for SpaceX, where, where's the talent pool coming from? Right? They're coming from from NASA, you know, ex NASA people or current NASA people. You know, they're not you're not grabbing people out of college. You're hiring you're hiring veterans if they're not already hand picked by NASA themselves. And and I, I can't stress this enough. NASA is a military operation. They are Department of Defense. They they are uniquely military. I mean, even even the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines can't hold a candle to NASA. NASA was formed on the missile technology from the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. It's a, it, just because they wear white outfits and don't carry guns and, and smile and wave for the camera doesn't mean they're they're not military. Of course they are. I thought that was Space Force, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I've got, I've, <laughs> I've got military friends that just howl at space. Space Force is just a, the rebranded Space Command that has been out there for a long, long time. Uh, they're 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 Air Force. No, they're no different than Air Force. They're not a separate brand. It's just something sexy they cooked up. Yeah. So uh, you know, throw a new wrinkle in there. It's like no, they're they're desk jockeys. They're not. They got okay. away. With it. They got oh. away with it because of the Space Marines and aliens and Starship Troopers. That's so, why they got away with it. The thing with with a lot of conspiracies, at least, is that it, the more people it requires, the harder it is to keep it a secret, right? Right. So let's let's say that the pilots are um, NASA, right? They're they already know. They've been informed. They've signed a non disclosure agreement or whatever. Had it's a little, it's a little more than that, but yes. Right, and their families threatened everything, right? Yeah, like, we're making sure they, they don't they're not gonna they're not gonna talk. They're not gonna talk. Um why what about everyone else in the control room, the people that are making no one, the else, no one else needs to know. So the astronauts, first off, you're absolutely right. First, they are Air Force officers, almost every single one of them. Uh usually they are colonels or higher. I mean, full bird colonels. And if you can make it to be a colonel in the military, you absolutely know how to keep your mouth shut. Second, those guys are psychologically profiled since minute one. And every astronaut, I guarantee, because I would do it, is I would tap their phones. <laughs> I would tap their emails. I would have de oh, dedicated yeah. people on every one of them. And if one of them even blinked in the other direction, it's like, I'm kind of feeling guilty. You would, you would, you would go at them with the carrot and the stick and you would say, Dude, 
don't do it or we will burn down your life. Not just you, we'll burn down everything. We'll make it. Right. There was, and, and as far as the other people are concerned, they don't have to know. The only guys that have to know in NASA are the telemetry guys. Telemetry being the people that tell you where the ship is once it leaves visual range. So once it leaves visual range, you ask the telemetry guys, oh, where is it? Oh, it's 400 miles this way and 70 miles up traveling at this right. sort of speed. And I highly sure. recommend, if, you, if you've never watched Capricorn 1 from the night, late 1970s, which was a fake Mars mission, by the way, that's the movie you want to see because there was this wonderful moment in there. That movie is never going to get rebooted and no one's ever going to make a sequel to it. There was this moment in there where a telemetry guy, a young guy, decided to run his own program because he didn't like the data that he was looking at. And he went to his reporter friend at a bar, and he was just kind of rambling. He wasn't even talking serious, right? And he says, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. He goes, the transmission couldn't have come from 70 miles away. And the second he said that, I mean within it was almost instant. There was a call. I mean, this is back in the landline days. Call to the bar for his reporter friend. His reporter picks up the call. There's nobody on the end of the phone. He comes back to the table, and his friend is gone. Gone, I mean forever gone. And when he went, like, the the, the next day, I mean, within, like, a, I think a day. True story. He went to his friend's apartment. There was another woman living there, and it looked like she'd been living there for 10 years. And even on her. And all, fake. Yeah, and all his magazine, even the magazines had the right labels on them for her. Like she'd been there forever. She'd been receiving yeah. magazine subscriptions for years. It's like they erased him from existence. The old the old line from, uh, oh, it was an 80s movie, which I love so much, which is, look, they'll they'll lock you in a room and throw away the room. You know, there's, there's if they wanted to. So the telemetry guys, same sort of thing. Non-disclosure, like don't even think about it. Everybody else, you just don't tell anything. And that's it. In fact, even even the astronauts, you don't tell them anything about a dome or a snow globe or anything like that. It's because the the original a astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, you told them. I, I I guarantee you, they told them. And these guys turned into freaking basket cases, not because they were scared, but because they were so they were so filled with guilt. Because you remember these guys when they came back, they were heroes. There were grade schools and high schools named after these guys. They had they closed down New York to, for parades for these guys. There's only there's only so much adulation you can be given for something you didn't do. Not even close. It's not like a like a sporting event where well, especially that time period, people love like if you were an American, you loved America. Not like today yeah. where you know. Oh hell, so they, not even not even then. One of the the anchors at Fox News, uh, Dana Perino. Uh, I remember she she was asked that she was quoting something about she was talking about the you know the conspiracy stuff and the moon program. She this line will stick with me forever. It just haunts me, where she says, "I believe in the in the moon missions because I'm a patriot." Right. <laughs> Trans. Remember, she was a press secretary for uh, um, the father Bush back in the day, and when she was really young, and and I got I understood it, which was she goes basically saying. You want to be a real American? You believe whatever the government tells you, period. And it's like, uh, that's fine and all, but I don't like plot holes. I, I don't like bad storytelling, which is why I criticize the think tanks as much as I can. It's like it's almost like nowadays, like they're not even trying or whoever's in there is just asleep at the wheel because the stuff they're just putting out there is dumb. It's just like, come on, this is silly. I don't, I don't like, I'm a big, big believer in writing. If there's a movie, it gets to a point You've done it yourself where you're like, it's like, ah, I'm not buying it. That's it. You're not invested. The suspension of disbelief goes away. And so that's, that's what I'm focused on. Huh? Yeah. yeah. That does, that does get rid of that issue of you need a lot of people for this. When you put it well, that like, like, don't think of anything different than the military, right? You don't tell the privates on the front because sometimes decisions have to be made, which they're not going to like, and they probably wouldn't go along with. If you right. know you're going to send a battalion into certain doom, do you really going to tell those guys that? No, no, of course right. not. And nor are you going to tell their initial commander or maybe even the commander above them. The generals know, but maybe even the colonels don't because you don't want any breakdown on that way. So you, you, you would not, it's not that it doesn't benefit you at all to tell everybody in the control room at NASA what you're up to. It doesn't help. 
It doesn't help. Uh, you and no, same reason why people say, oh, you know, people say, oh, Neil deGrasse Tyson must know, you know, the most famous scientist in the world. And it's like, no, no, you want him on stage what acting naturally. Wouldn't his knowledge tell him, like, well, this doesn't make sense? Denial is a powerful thing. Come on. Uh, there's, there's an old private detective saying, which is, never take jealous wives as clients. Because until they know for sure that their husband is cheating, he isn't. You know what I mean? You can suspect all day long but uh, for something, but denial, we hold on to denial. So until somebody shows you the debrief, slaps it down on, you know, in a file in front of you, then it becomes real. Or as the old saying goes, you know, shit just got real. Right? People can speculate all day long. Uh, same thing with yeah. the military guys, right? Not just Neil deGrasse Tyson. Imagine you're a, a full bird colonel astronaut, right? Yeah. You 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 can suspect stuff all day. Come on, there's military guys. I'm sure all over the place. Most military people have never ever been to Area 51. They know it's there, but they've never seen it. Right? Yeah. It's a difference between being told, being whispering. It's like, dude, I knew a guy that knew a guy that knew a guy. Different from when, from walking at the front gates. Right, which is why one of my favorite favorite little stories is that um, Eisenhower, in my opinion, the only the last president with any independent power, um, he calls up the guys when he finally found out that Area 51 was being finished, right, and he had nothing to do with it. You know, he uh, he go, he calls him up and says, "Hey, I'd like to come out there and take a tour, right?" But he was president then; he wasn't a five-star general; he was a president, which is lower <laughs> than a five-star general. And they say, sorry, you don't have clearance. You're a civilian now. I didn't know that. And he pulls up. That's how the story goes. Anyway, I, I love the story because I absolutely can see it happening where he calls it. He, he goes, look, um, well, here's what's going to happen. I'm just going to call up one of my buddies, you know, one of the generals that's running like the first army. And we're just going to roll in there and I'm going to take a look for myself anyway. So what do you think about that? And and they said, all right, fine, you can you can come out and see it. <laughs> and he did it. The point was, is that until until he saw it for himself, it was an itch that couldn't be scratched. And he was one of the few people that could actually pull that off. Everybody else in the military can just speculate on it. Yeah. They know it's there. They absolutely know it's there. It's, it's not even a question anymore. We, we know the base exists, but it's a secret base, sort of secret. Secret in that we know it's in there, uh, but really there. secret that we don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Yeah. That is... Uh... That is interesting. Um, no, it's so, let's say let's say Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're right, right? And he he just can't. He's in denial. He can't go against what he already believes. Sure. So he's always trying. Well, to remember, he's, he has a PhD in astronomy. So, and I've said this since since I started this, which is if you have a master's degree in a physical science, you're done. There's nothing I can do to, to get past that. The conditioning is too strong. And even if I could, you, you're not going to, you couldn't accept it because you've spent so much money and so much time on this that it would turn your, it would, it, your world would, would, would just crumble around yeah, you. But, well, the issue with that is like there's people that prove otherwise, right? Um, an example that I can think of is Dr. Robert Malone. Sure. Uh, Everyone was saying, like, no, this is safe. This is safe. You can do this. Nothing happens. And he came out saying, look, I'm the father of this, and it's not safe. The rats that we did this to, right? it, it, was, not, it was never a good outcome. Don't right. do it. Right. And now, yeah, he is one of the few that came out and said, don't. But yeah. there's an example of someone that's involved in it and that says, hey, look, the, Maybe they're not lying to you, but they don't understand what they're actually doing. Yeah. So why, why don't we see that in the scientific community? In his case, it, there's a line from JFK, which is there's too much, there's too much light on Malone. If, if there wasn't, he'd be dead already. And other doctors have gone away because of that. When it comes to the scientific community, the scariest world, the, different from the, the medical community, which has its own standards. In the scientific community, it's all about the peer groups, which is all you care about when you get to a certain level of academia is you want to be published, 
not commercially, just published, you know, papers, peer reviewed papers. And you you want to, you know, you want to have that core group. And the scariest word for any academic is is ostracized, which is if you get kicked out of your peer group, you're stuck. Because getting into another one is extremely hard to do. You know, it's the 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 the, the rumor mills and the gossip mills, the word travels fast. And you basically become an island. You're you're on your own. Nobody wants to play Red Rover in that situation. Nobody wants to do it. You take a chance and it doesn't work. And it, even if it did work, what are you hoping to get out of it? I mean, if you don't have some sort of trust fund backing you, if you're not absolutely financially independent and you don't care about your your studies anymore, you you're, you know, that reduces the the amount of people that could come out by ninety nine percent. And at that point, then you can, you know, if you're the government, you can monitor the only one percent and see who's, you know, worth as as much as as much as um, uh, he tried, you know, came, tried to come out and and do stuff. The mainstream media still doesn't talk to him if they can help it. You know what I mean? Alternative media will talk to him, sure, but the mainstream media won't, and that's that's the currency nowadays, which is. From what I have seen, and in fact, stories that I run every Tuesday, which is it's amazing to me how many people die and only the local news will cover it. And they have to, right? They they have to because they have to say, oh, yeah, such and such kid from, you know, 18 years old. Well, yeah, mostly, because, mostly because you you submit, like you write out a form and, and tell the newspaper, hey, pull their Yeah, yeah. You've got, yeah, you, people have to. But that's it. It never goes in. It rarely goes further than that. I mean, unless it's sensationalized a little bit. But the, I've seen now they, they've started to figure it out that that all we have to do is keep it from a national level and people aren't going to be comparing notes that much. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's Facebook and there's Rumble and there's videos that can be made and people can do compilations. It kind of goes along with that. Um, uh, it, it, I'm trying to come up with a new quote for it nowadays, which is if the main, you know, the tree, if the tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, it still make a sound. Well, if the me, if an event happens and mainstream media doesn't cover it, did it happen? You know what I mean? It's like, well, yeah, it did. It's like, yeah, but did it? Because yeah. unless it's in the, the general public consciousness, you know, it doesn't, there's all sorts of stuff that's being suppressed now. And, uh, Anyway, yeah. Um, okay, I have another question, but hold on. Give me like five seconds. I'll be right sure. back. Okay, so like. Hey, but by the way, um, the 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 episode that blew my mind the most. By the way, San Pier, I think was the best episode of Black Mirror, but the one that blew my mind the most was Bandersnatch. Which one was? Oh, the the one that you could pick your story. The one where you can pick. Because when I watched it, I watched it entirely, the, almost entirely to almost entirely the end because I didn't know what to do. I was just watching the show with a friend of mine and we're watching this. We're like, it's like, and it was, you know, because if you don't do anything, it'll keep playing. You know, it'll it'll go through different scenarios. And I'm going, what the hell? And then all of a sudden I noticed that bar on the bottom and, you know, that time limit bar. And I'm going, wait a minute. And I picked up the remote. I was going, no. No, this is interactive. <laughs> it's so freaking wild. It just yeah, just blew my mind. That, that was awesome when they did that episode, man. I couldn't. Yeah. I, I wish they'd do more like that. That was really cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, I do too. It was it was so revolutionary, and you can only do that in the purely digital streaming age. Yeah. So brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It was, it was excellent. Okay, um, I have two questions that I can think of. Okay. One is, and I'm gonna say them back to back, and then you can just go off. Okay. One is um, the equator, right? Yeah. You'd be able to if the if there's this flat, you'd see the sun regardless of where you are. But for some reason, when you're south of the equator, you can't see it. Right. The other one is, um, why do you think we're in a uh, simulation? Okay. First one, uh, as far as the sun goes. And and I, unfortunately, I blame the limits of our artist rendering of this, which is every flat Earth, almost every flat Earth model shows the sun way too large. So if when you see a flat Earth model, even if it's a, in a snow globe model, the sun is usually drawn. It's roughly, I don't know, a thousand miles wide. And the reason why it's drawn about a thousand miles wide is because 
there's no if you drew it any smaller it, you almost wouldn't be able to see it yeah i so, get the concept uh, that it's like a spotlight i've gotten that far yeah, yeah yeah i mean but it's tiny by comparison so it's only we say it's like maybe not even 50 miles wide because remember the blackout zone of the moon which is the same size is only 70 miles wide so 50 miles wide if, if we're talking about a 50 mile wide object on a terrain that's thousands of miles wide it's nothing it's absolutely nothing and if it's more like directional like a spotlight absolutely that's how it would work whereas like you know when it goes off in the distance it just goes off into the distance and be, between the side between the size being so small and the thickness of the atmosphere and there's some wonderful videos on this um there's one uh, i put on my channel uh, i can't remember where david weiss got it from where the sun goes off you think it's setting right but it's just yeah, going off it's going off in the distance off in the distance and if you keep zooming in on it with a special camera to where you know it's not not blinding out you see it just fade away it just yeah. just just fades away but to the naked eye you wouldn't know any different because the atmosphere makes it look like it's setting in the distance that's brilliant i i think that is a, just a design wonderfulness because it convinces almost everybody right away again why people don't bring it is oh you know ships go over the horizon it's like why didn't you bring up the sun first it's because the sun is the most obvious one you would pick but almost nobody picks the sun yeah. but now that we have different you know better hd technology we can do the same thing with it it's like no there's the sun it just went poof off the distance. So can you see it if it's nighttime and you're below the equator? Right. You'd be able to see it no. the whole time, 24 hours, right? With no. the camera. No, no, no. No. Why? Why, why would why would you see it below uh, on the southern side of the equator? No, no, no. If it's a globe, you won't, right? But if it's flat. No, wouldn't wouldn't no, wouldn't okay. If it's a globe, of course you won't, but that's the brilliance of it. When it in a flat model. In a globe, remember, you're assuming that the sun is monstrous, hundreds of thousands of miles wide and 93 million miles away, yeah. right? That's the only way it can light up a globe the way it does. Yeah. But in ours, if the sun is very, very close and very, very small, it does the same thing. Perspective. By the way, that, that leads into a human weakness, which is we are terrible at determining uh, size and relative motion of anything. Right. Absolutely right. terrible at it. So... I tell people, you know, I go, oh, the sun's 93 million miles away and uh, hundreds of thousands of miles wide. And they go, yeah. And I go, how do you know that? Well, it's because we were told this. It's like, yeah. But it but, looks the same if it's 50 miles wide and only thousands, 3,000 miles away. On a flat Earth with a telescope, you'd That's be right. able to see the sun. From where? Right? What? No. <laughs> what? No, okay, if, if the Earth okay, is flat, are we talking about we're talking? Are we talking about the twenty-four hour sun in the Arctic type thing, or are we just talking about looking off in the distance? Twenty-four hour sun, so it's midnight. Well, well, okay, and you're and you're in Chile, and you have a powerful telescope. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. So twenty-four hour sun. That is, by the way, the biggest weakness of flat Earth because there's got to be there's a light. There's something we don't know. Everything, obviously, when it comes to the Arctic, twenty-four hour sun that works no problem on a on a flat Earth model, snow globe. But 24-hour sun in Antarctica, for example, don't even say Chile, just go go for broke, go say Antarctica. That can't work unless, and there's some, there's two schools of thought. There's some people that say that there's footage altered and that there is no 24-hour sun in Antarctica. However, I know people personally, people I would consider wouldn't lie to me, that say they've been there during the 24-hour sun. If that's the case, then there's something going on with, a, with the light source down in Antarctica that we don't know about. I, that I can't explain, but since it hardly ever ever comes up, and no one ever bothers to ask me that, I I luck out there. However, let's go. Let's go this. Let's, hold on. To give credit to your movement, the idea, um, we it's impossible for us to know everything about everything. We can only get us so far as we're able to. Uh, learn. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people say like, what's what's the dome made out of? I'm going. I don't know. I mean, I could give you like six or seven options as far as what the dome's made out of but right. until until i can actually be there and knock on it myself sort of like again which is why i criticize science for like the core of the earth argument which is you show us you know this this red and orange and yellow and but white how do you know that's yeah that's and i, I think that's fair, that's fair for both parties right like you've never even come close in fact in wikipedia they actually say it's like yeah we have no idea and you look at the fine print of wikipedia there's we have no idea what's down there so yeah. why do you keep showing us that freaking cutaway drawing that you've been showing us forever? 
And it's like, well, because science doesn't, science will not put a question mark in a textbook. They just won't do it. They'll say, this is science. This is our best guess. But we're not going to say guess anymore. This is what it is. And then when it changes, when they're completely wrong, it's like, this is the new what it is. <laughs> it's like, okay. And we're not going to apologize for anybody that we made fun of leading up this point or yeah. give much, you know, much credit to anybody that discovered it first. Only the, the, the peer reviewed people, they're going to yeah. get. The hubris is definitely present. I yes, science yeah. is, science has become their their own religion for for some time. Yeah, as and far I think as, uh, this whole pandemic made it a little more obvious to most people how. Well, uh, I wouldn't say most, but a lot, a lot of people. And and of course, they learn. Enough, they yeah. learn the saying goes, they learn the hard way. And uh, yeah, I feel yeah. I feel bad in some ways, but at the same time, look, I was putting content out for. Since since minute one, I was I was making videos. It's like you, but and <clears throat> I wasn't even saying don't take it. I was saying at the bare minimum, just wait and see what happens. Don't just rush in there. It's like oh, I gotta get, I've gotta do this. And it's like man, yeah. When it first came out, I was in the same boat you were. Where I was like, I don't. I oh, just, I, now, I just don't get me wrong. I was never gonna take it. But I, the, I could, I would be, it would be irresponsible for me to, to tell people that I was absolutely certain that you shouldn't. But at the, at the again, the bare minimum was like, just don't, don't rush in. Don't right, just, just wait to find out. That's, that's, yeah, what, that's, that's, my the, position, that's my position for most news things that come out. Yeah. It's like, this is the initial story. Let's wait for more information to come out so we can have a better grasp on what's actually going on. There you go. But that's not what they wanted. They no. wanted people to rush out there as fast as they could. And they got a lot of people that way. Well, and you got a free cheeseburger out of it. So, I mean, why would you? Oh, uh, your care? Krispy Kreme donuts <laughs> are all sorts of free shit. Yeah, that, that's, that, by that point, I mean, by that point, I already knew I wasn't going to take it. And so it was just a little ridiculous. Like, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. As far as, let, let's wrap this up with the simulations thing. Okay. Yeah. So the simulation thing. Why do I think it's a simulation? Two reasons. One is a physics experiment that goes back quite a ways and then was modified decade after decade, which is known as a double slit experiment, which is like explain it to everyone else. Yeah. OK, the double slit experiment says it is the tree falling in the forest argument, which is if a tree falls in the forest and you aren't there to witness it, does it make a sound? Now, I was asked this in the 1970s and as a kid, and I was like, I have no idea what, you know, what it means, because it, it really was dealing with consciousness at that point. It's like, you know, does your reality help help mean this? However, the double slit experiment says what, what was happening was it was found by accident of all things. That's the part that bugged me, which is if you fire single electrons, we'll just call them grains of sand, right? Just for people to understand, instead of using the word electrons. If you fire them at a, at a plate with slits in front of it, two slits, double slits, right? When, they go th when it goes through there, it, it hits the wall on the other side, it makes a certain pattern, right? Because it's no different than like firing ping pong balls, you know, through these double slits. Yeah, but if you're firing grains of sand, but electrons, a single electron, right? The smallest thing we could possibly fire through them. The problem was is that when we weren't watching the experiment, right, it didn't go through like a particle. It went through like it transformed into this like ethereal wave, like and and hit the hit the wall on the other side like a wave. And it's like, wait, wait, wait you know, turn turn the camera back on and and watch this thing closely. And every time you looked at it, it acted like a particle. But that that that's really tough for, for science to wrap its head around, except that it was absolutely repeatable. And if it's repeatable, then it's science. So it's kind of like, it's going to sound juvenile, but it's kind of like if you ever had that friend that was quick enough, it was making faces behind your back, but every time you turned around, he was his face was straight. Yeah. Right? That's what it was like, which was like, okay, if, if he's making a face behind me or isn't he, right? Because every time I look at him, he's not. But every time I'm not looking, he supposedly is, but I can't prove it because I'm not looking at him. And you're thinking, okay, what's this got to do with reality? The problem is, is that this is what we do in computer simulations all the time when we're making computer simulations. It, it's otherwise known as like things like flashlight graphics. 
So when you're ever playing a game, I don't know if you've ever played many games, but wherever you're playing, well, if it's a first person game, whether, you know, be it Fortnite or, or GTA or Warcraft or anything like that, whatever you're looking at in front of you is being rendered completely because you're facing that direction. What you don't know is everything behind you is just a blob. It's just nothing because you're not facing that way. So there's right. really, and, and if you're on another street, right, the, whatever, whatever street you're on, you're looking at it, everything, you know, people are walking around, everything is looking good, right? The next street over, which you can't see, is completely black. Right. There's so like for everyone else, if you're playing a video game, an open world, and there's a hill, yeah, you can see the trees on the other side of the hill or the, the valley, but you can't see the valley. So what the game does is it just doesn't make the valley at all. It's exactly. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. So or or you know you 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 tell someone to pretend you're a developer, right? If you know your character is not going to get to the other side of that mountain, do you draw the trees on the other side of that mountain? No, of course not. Why would you? Your character is right. never ever going there. So why would you draw any of that? So right. the question is, why is that happening here? Meaning that what I just described to you, what's hap what we do in our simulations. That's what's happening here now, because what's happening is whatever you're not looking at right now in front of you is not being rendered exactly perfectly behind you. In fact, the hallway behind you, which if your door is closed, may not exist at all. Unless and you say, well, and you say, I'm sorry, what? Unless someone else is there looking at it. Well, then that goes into a whole nother thing, doesn't it? Because... Hey, what? Wouldn't that other person affect that? Well, if that person's actually a person. Well, okay, hold on, because now this is this is more what I want to dive into. Um, <laughs> yeah, unless you, you start, on. you started down this. Look, the movie. Yeah, no, this is what, got way. What I'm, what I'm basically saying is the movie Free Guy. NPC. Was, it was all about NPCs. But in the NPC world, the, and of course they embellished for the uh, for the movie because they had to make it colorful. The truth is, if the players, you know, the super players aren't running around doing anything, the NPC world is absolutely black. The NPCs don't do anything because yeah. the NPCs are just programs. They're just numbers. They only react they, to the player. They might as well be just leaves on a tree. In fact, the early NPCs were literally just that. They were just notes on the ground. Or then notes that were attached to a tree. And then finally it's like, oh, let's make a person that just gives limited responses. Okay, let's make that person walk around. And finally it's like, hey, you know what? Let's make this person have their whole another life, depending on how much programming you want to throw into it. Right? You think that's mind-blowing, right? So I, I won't go into too much of that. That's a whole other discussion for another time. But I'll take it one step further, which is it may be even worse than that. So... There's something you can look up online. The double slit experiment you can look up all day long on Wiki. It's pretty interesting. But that's basically the gist of it, what I just described there. And why is the double slit experiment important? Because we do that in programming. The, the, the question is, is that why the double slit, slit experiment predates programming by a long time? Right. All programming. So the question is, how did it happen that we were, we only figured it out after we were doing the programming? It's like, oh, wait. Sounds familiar what we're doing here. All right. You know, and then the similarities were, were way too scary. The um the other part of this is something you can also look up on wiki. It's called neuroscience and free will. This one I'm far more fond of because it's also something we do. In fact, we've only been doing it in the last five, six years. What is it? I don't know what that is. Okay, so go back I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, and back when Programmers were trying to figure out what to do with crap, and scientists were working with computer programmers. You hook up electrodes to people's brains, you know, just, you know, sticky stickies on the outside of their head type things. And they were like, you know, okay, pick numbers, you know, on a computer while we monitor your brain waves, even though they knew almost nothing about brain waves, very rudimentary stuff. And they so, say, you know, pick a number between one and 10. And not only that, but find, figure out, you know, by the timer up on the clock, the moment that you decided to pick the number between one and ten, right? Oh, that's a little hard. So watch. So so what was so it's like oh right now I'll do it to you right you don't have to tell me pick a number between one and ten right now okay and then you picked a number right yeah this is this is where it gets weird the computer even though it wasn't sophisticated to know what number you chose it knew that you chose a number the thing was it knew you chose a number 
seven to eight seconds before you made the decision and told me. It's like, wait a minute, what are you saying? I'm saying that when you thought of the number four or three, right? Before you even chose the number three, the computer already knew that you chose the number. That's not possible because that, that I chose. The, the computer, basically we're talking about predestination, something that science really, really hates. Meaning you already chose the number because you were, it was already scripted. So I mean, bear with me for a second. Imagine this, maybe you're not in some sort of virtual reality. Maybe it's more concrete than that. Maybe you are in a virtual pre-recorded movie that wow. where, you, where you made the decisions long before you got here to this moment. And you're saying, well, that's a little tough to grasp. It's like, is it? Think about this. There are people out there, and you may have even done this once or twice in your life, that now they don't even play their own games. They just go to YouTube and watch people on YouTube play the games, right? Yeah. You may have even caught yourself doing it, right? Even like you want to get through a certain level. You'll watch a guy, but what you don't like, realize yeah. is when you're watch, watching that guy play that game, when you're getting almost identical the experience of actually playing the game yourself, but all you're doing is watching a little MP4, right? just a little, just a tiny little movie with almost no resources that was pre-recorded weeks, months, maybe even years ago. So what's the difference? The difference is huge in that if it's pre-recorded, think about this. Let's say you want to go, and there's a couple movies, sci-fi things that have touched on this. Say you wanted to go into a, into a world like this. It doesn't have to be interactive, real time. Why would you ever do that? It's inefficient. You do a pre, you do a pre-record. You you know you pre you do all everything scripted out in advance. You pick the high points, low points. So he's like, this is where I'm going to go to school. This is where I'm going to get married. This is my career. I'm going to break my arm here. I'm going to win the lottery here. Blah blah blah. Right. And then it fills in all the other little parts for you. You don't have to pick that you're going to brush your right. teeth. Everything. So wait, are you saying my my ethereal self screwed over my normal self, the what the one that I am now? <sighs> For a reason, which also leaves the whole concept of God. Because yeah, he hates me. Uh, off the right, table. Right. No, not necessarily, not necessarily, because if it's school, if you're here for a reason, I, and let me, I, I will kind of wrap this up with this. I'm a big believer in dualism, which is, I believe, not only does the world run off of novelty, which is another discussion for another time, what's new, you know, without novelty, we are lost. It's sort of the Agent Smith argument, which is without purpose, we, you know, we don't exist. Um. But not just not just novelty, but dualism. So you can't appreciate one thing without the other. I mean, you can't appreciate hot without cold, pain without pleasure, pleasure, light without shadow, right? So how do you really know what, what this this world is? Ninety nine percent conflict. No one would ever dispute that, right? Doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are, you always have something to complain about constantly. Yeah. Every, everybody is constantly in a state of conflict here. It is it is is almost inescapable. Even if you were a Buddhist monk hovering three feet off the ground in a Tibetan mountain somewhere, you still have to deal with mortality sooner or later and brushing and brushing your teeth from time to time. So if that's the case, then whatever's outside of here is probably. 99 percent unlimited, 99 percent not conflict. And again, you would only appreciate that world by coming to a world like this, uh, sort of like this. It's, it's the um, it's the genie and the wish. I, I got I got to wrap this up eventually. Yeah, make this. But let me let me do this. So the genie the genie and the wish concept. So you've heard you've heard this before, right? And genie and genie yeah. pops out and says it give you three wishes, but you're sharper than that. It's like, hey, you know what? My first wish is going to be a million wishes, yeah. sucker. Right, and you start rolling through wishes. Right, you go, you 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 as much money as you ever wanted, best health ever. Uh, you dated everyone you wanted to date. You were a football star. You were a guitar hero. You were a fireman. You were whatever you want. You hell, you spent five hundred years laying on a beach drinking margaritas. Whatever it is, you did it. Well, problem is, eventually, you're gonna run out of ideas. You're gonna run out of novelty. It doesn't matter. Genie just start looking at his watch, going, "Uh huh, what's next? I can be, I, I got all the time in the world." And he does. Right? 
And again, this is there, there was a Twilight Zone that kind of touched on this. It was like, was that actually heaven or was it hell? Well, it's all another discussion for another time. So eventually you go, you're tapped out of the ideas. Say it takes you a thousand years. Say it takes 5,000 years. It doesn't make any difference. Sort of the same reason why they don't put clocks or windows in casinos, right? To distort time. Yeah. Well, eventually you go to the, the genie and you're like, dude, I am out. I'm. What do I do? What do I do? And he goes, well, I got a place you can go. You're going to hate it. It sucks. There's a million ways to die. You're going to be complaining all the time. Uh, in fact, it's better if you suffer. You know, the, the line from the Matrix, human beings seem to define the reality through misery and suffering. Yeah. And he goes, but at the end, if, you know, after your 70 years or whatever it is, you know, the longer you stay, the better, apparently. Once you get out of there, you're going to come back here. It's going to be like brand new. You're going to love this place again. It's like, wow, that sounds great. What's the catch? He goes, the catch is you're not even going to remember we had this conversation. And he snaps his fingers Thanos style. And voila, you are here. Uh -huh. And here you remain. And again, I, and I think it's cyclical. I think that's how it works. This place so, isn't, isn't okay. a paradise. It, is, it, is, it isn't a prison. It is a school. More than anything else, it's just to teach you perspective. Doesn't matter if you go to jail for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter if you, uh, you know, if you're if you're rich. Although, let's face it, the trust fund kids uh, are usually the ones, and that's why there's so few of them. Those are the ones that crash and burn. You know, the child actors, yeah. you know, the, the 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 children of, of of people that you know heirs to fortunes. They'd self destruct usually by twenty. So, yeah. there. So, clarify. Basically, the idea is. I am playing a game, a video game. Of yourself. Of me. Yep. <laughs> but it's not even a game. You know, you yeah, play. Yeah. No, play let's play. get into it. Because yeah. I, I, want, I want you back on, man. Like, this is... <laughs> I, okay. thought, I thought, like, Flat Earth had a border, and it was small. And it seems like it's a lot bigger than what I was anticipating. Well... I mean, it, where you are is relatively small in the grand scheme of things, sure, but it's still a big place. The Stephen Wright um, comedian line, which I love so much, he goes, he goes, it's a small world, he goes, but I wouldn't want to paint it. It's very, very large, but it's still, you know, we, we think of it as small, you know, mostly because we, we've grown up being told that the universe is very, very big. And come on, if you throw in like Star Wars and Star Trek and stuff like that, it makes yeah. it seem like we're just, we're just... You know, we're not even getting a little piece of the action, but I think the truth is even worse than that, in that we came from from a very, very big unlimited place. And uh -huh. we were here we're here to appreciate what we had. Yeah. So, so I've I've heard of the simulation theory, just not like that. Maybe because I'm, you know. Oh no, and most people don't talk about the simulation theory like that. They they yeah. talk about it. In fact, the, the hip thing now is talking about quantum. You know, right. you know, parallel universes and all that crap. And it's like, yeah, I guess. So um, I'd definitely like to have you back. Yeah, yeah, let me know. Unbox all that. Uh, do you have any, like, anything you want to say? Plug in your stuff? Oh, yeah. Um, if, yeah, if anyone wants to know what, where to find me, just go into Google and type in um, Flat Earth Mark. That's it. And uh, that will lead you down some sort of rabbit hole, and it'll eventually get to my stuff. I'm not really selling anything. I've got some books on Amazon, and the documentary did well. Um, but plug those in, man. Might as well. The what? Well, I said plug them. Why not? Oh, the books? Well, no, just just again, just type type Mark Sargent into into Mark Sargent Flat Earth into anything. I don't care what it is. Um, into Sorry, Google into Amazon. Uh, S A R G E N T, right? Yeah, G N T. You will you will find my stuff somewhere. If you pick up some stuff, great. Not, you know, it's not going to be a make it or break it break it thing. It's all about your knowledge and and your uh, your desire to uh, kind of go beyond the normal stuff. But I will warn people. This is my my parting shot. I will warn people. If you wake up every day and your life is great, everything is awesome, like the song, uh, then don't look at this. And this is not reverse psychology. I mean it, because there is a point, much like the Matrix, it's a red pill, blue pill type deal, where once you get past a certain point and you start going into the hole, the, the too far down the flat earth rabbit hole, you're not coming out of it. You are, you are, you're in. And, yeah. uh, and it, it is wonderful, but at the same time, it's bittersweet 
because ignorance is bliss. And uh, I told again I, the cipher line which he used. You know, he was trying to convince himself that the steak he was eating was great. And he's like, oh. Yeah, he's like, I know it's not steak, but it tastes like steak. Yeah, it tastes like steak, but I'm not in the steak world anymore. And it's like, yeah, I know, but yeah. it's still, it's still, it's still a cool place to be. And the community is very, very cool. And uh, we we've been doing this for a while now. So yeah, I mean, yeah. Look, look. You're not on TikTok. Uh, I don't know. I pe- my videos are either on TikTok. I don't. I don't. I, don't, I, don't, I only manage a YouTube account, but I know that I've got things everywhere. Other people do it for me. I don't even know who they are. They just do it anonymously. <laughs> and You're so, okay with that, right? Like you don't mind people getting your stuff. Care. No, no, no. I, I made my stuff Creative Commons license, so right. you can take my stuff and, and throw it anywhere they want. I, I make I don't make a dime off of it except for the the books and and honestly I even released I think the audio the the big audio book the big five hour one um, on YouTube for free so all right anyway. you, guys, you guys heard it um, check it out well thanks there's more here than you might think I think that's like even if you're skeptical and you're or not skeptical if you don't think there's a chance a snowball's chance in hell that the earth is flat um, if I'll look at it anyway. Yeah, if you're that confident, then why, why not, right? Yeah. If anything, you have more of a reason to dive into it because I mean, you're you're so assured that this isn't the case. Um, well, anyways, uh, do you have any parting words? Anything that you want to tell anyone? It, uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last, last, last parting word is uh, everything I've been saying for the last couple hours. Uh, just take take with a grain of salt. I'm not uh, I'm not here to convince you or persuade you i am here to just throw the idea out and and see if it resonates in the end you will have to do your own research which is why our retention rate is so high you know do don't don't condemn it just because you heard from somebody else you should condemn it figure it out for yourself and if you still hate it yeah drop me a line and say you know what i looked into it i still hate it i have never gotten one of those ever so yeah, please, we'll see. please do that and do this with everything not just flat earth anything that you hear in the news or media or school look into it yourself look for alternative views and then come to your own conclusion because sometimes people have agendas and yep. and money talks well so said there's yep. always that um thank you guys for listening you can reach out to us at what's wrong with think at gmail.com um matt or mark Sargent, do you have uh an email they can reach you at <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you want to email me, just, you know, my email, if you don't write it down here, my email address is literally in the description box of every video on YouTube I make, uh, along with my home email address, my phone number, uh, everything else. Uh, but my email address is M as in Mark Sargent, S-A-R-G-E-N-T, at, I'm sorry, M Sargent 23 at Comcast.net. All right. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you all enjoyed the show and uh, we'll have them back soon, hopefully, to the open this Pandora's box a little bit more. Okay. Anyways, y'all have a nice night. All right, so I stopped recording on my end. Oh, um, yeah. Hey, man, I appreciate it. Uh...